Get it in as far yep. as you can. Yeah. <coughs> the ground's just a bit hard here, isn't yeah. it? Well, mine's okay. So am I. Let's get the posts in. Well, I'm going to use the uh, 260s zoom, I think. Because he's not right on top, and we might get some shots of him nymphing as well. Okay. Yep, that's fine. A series of photographs can help analyze a rise that's over in a trice. He just took he just took a done, John. He's just taken a done. Yeah, he's in quite a nice position now. Oh, beautiful. Now you tell me when he starts. Yeah, to he's rise. coming again, he's coming again. Got, Got it. Smashing. That's a beautiful shot. The sequence is documented. So it's possible for the skilled angler to deduce the food of a fish solely from the speed and form of the rise. And this is vital information in choosing the right artificial fly. But without a skillful presentation, the trout won't take an artificial copy, no matter how perfect a mimic it is. Casting the tiny, almost weightless fly is an art in itself. Here, Brian Clark is using a nymph pattern. He's dropped it sharply through the water surface towards a feeding fish. A perfect cast has to combine the timing of a golf swing with the accuracy of an archer hitting gold. It's one of the most elegant movements in the whole of sport. The line is gradually let out in false casts. Its own weight provides the only momentum for the speck at the line's end. The distance is carefully and finely judged. John Goddard strikes too. Playing the fish at the surface prevents the line tangling around weeds. There are some anglers who can go through a whole season without even hooking a fish as small as this. A trout that started its life back in the midst of winter. The kennet in mid-December is a far cry from the leafy profusion of high summer. But even now, in these cold, wintry waters, life is beginning. Pairs of trout come together in the reds, excavated by females in the gravel. Eggs are released and fertilized with a joint quiver and gape. And then the female buries them. Food for the trout is in shorter supply in the cold waters of winter. But among the gravel, the inch-long larvae of our largest mayfly, Ephemera danica, burrow around. Only a few months away now from the climax of its two-year life cycle. Above the gravel, the refuse collectors of the riverbed scurry about. The freshwater shrimps, that can number as many as 8,000 for every square meter of river by the end of summer.
But most remarkable of all is this lava, a caddis. It's one of nature's stonemasons. Its soft body is protected by a male coat of minute pebbles, each one secured painstakingly with a weft of silken thread. Case building is a slow and laborious business, with every grain carefully selected and positioned. Over the following eight hours, this is how it completed its masonry. It even uses a discarded tube from a smaller caddis species. The finished case provides it with both protection and camouflage. Like its insect cousins above the water, the caddis has a pupil stage. The adult develops in this chitin sarcophagus to emerge as the winged sedge fly. Caught at the surface, they're a favorite food for the trout. But whether it's proper or permissible to fish with imitations of anything other than winged adult flies on the surface, became one of the bitterest disputes in angling history, and the ripples still last today. The basic rules were laid down in the late 19th century. They were simple but strict, and their instigator was Frederick Halford, who declared that an angler should only cast upstream to a fish that was seen to be rising. And more importantly, the trout had to be caught with an artificial winged copy of a natural fly. Some of Holford's own patterns here, although they're faded now, are still remarkably good mimics of the real thing. He even went so far as dressing different patterns of male and female insects. But in 1899, a letter was published in the field that Holford and his followers were never able to accept. It came from G.E.M. Skews, an innovator who had the temerity to suggest that it was equally ethical to fish for trout with a nymph below the surface of the water. And so began a controversy that was to be argued and debated heatedly for 40 years and more, and all about these twists of fur and feather. Although Skews eventually felt that he'd won the argument, he still felt obliged in 1938 to resign his rod from waters he'd fished for nearly 60 years, mainly because of objections to these patterns. Skews's nymph fishing is accepted almost universally now, and he's joined Holford as one of the giants of angling history. But were their patterns really so perfect? Although they seem so lifelike to us, how does the trout see them in its world? And, as important for the angler, what does the trout see of our world? The reflections from the surface of calm water become more and more definite with an increasingly oblique view. And it's similar for a trout looking upwards. Fish live, as it were, in a world with a mirrored ceiling, except for a round skylight directly above them. Where the water is too deep or turbid, the mirror has little it can reflect. But in clean, shallower water, the stones and water weeds of the bed are clearly visible in the mirrored surface. In the window, bending of the light, like a stick half in water, works in reverse too, and the angler is distorted, particularly low down near the mirror's edge. So what does this trout in a shallow lie see of the world about it? Above the water, its vision is limited. It sees little below an angle of 10 degrees. The rest of the surface acts as a mirror. Rays of light through the window bend by refraction. And in the mirror, the trout sees a reflection of the riverbed. Get this last bit of weeding and then we can go. To discover even more about a trout's vision, 
and particularly how it sees its food, Clark and Goddard have experimented with a variety of their own designs of sloping-sided tanks. Actually, that breeze will help us a bit because it will drift it along from the window right into the mirror, which will be just about right. All right, let's get in position. In this one, they can examine both natural and artificial flies at every angle in relation to the sun's position. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Let him get the sunlight on in the other side. Yeah, okay. Tell me. Is that's, that's, right. Right. that's perfect. I've got it right in the window now. Okay. Okay, take your hand away. Good. Beautiful shot. In photograph by cameras on the riverbed, they know that this is how flies must look to it. But why does a trap begin to rise to a fly that's so far upstream that it should be hidden by the mirror effect? It was a question that Clark and Goddard had to answer. And looking at live flies from below the surface presents problems. When one stays long enough, though, the results are fascinating. Here, in the mirror, the insect's feet are dimpling the surface film. It's distorted, almost as if it were made of rubber. The wings appear to be separate from the rest of the fly. Their position has been altered by refraction. As the current carries it slowly towards the window, the disembodied wings gradually merge with the pattern of the feet until the whole insect is seen at the mirror's edge. Almost overhead, and the water repellent properties of the fly's legs are even more noticeable. The problem then was to copy these natural effects with an artificial fly. This is an over elaborate traditional dressing. From the side, the hook, body, and feathery hackle dip well into the water. Seen from below, the offending parts show up clearly. The hook and its reflection make a double image in the mirror. This is one of Clark and Goddard's new patterns. A radical design with the body of the fly sitting above the surface. And from underneath, it makes dimples in the mirror much as the natural fly does. And the wings merge realistically. These wings are functional too because they help to make the fly drift down and land the right way up. Comparing the new design with a manufactured traditional one, the improvement in realism is remarkable. The new fly is on the left. There's little doubt which one would be chosen by a really discriminating, educated trout. So from their tests, Clark and Goddard knew that a trout's feeding response must first be stimulated by the dimple of tiny feet in the mirror. And they had made a pattern that could do just that. But their theories and designs still had to be tested thoroughly in the field. Stuart Cannum is a very gifted fly dresser. What exactly is it that you want me to do, John? Well, we want you to tie these patterns up for us in belt, the new patterns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, two or three dozen of each, if possible, yes. for, for testing purposes. Because over the next season, we've got to thoroughly test them out, you know, before we uh, eventually approve them. Quite. Uh, show them a few, John. Let's, let's, yes, uh, let's, let's show them what it's all about. Let's see exactly what they are. Well, look, what I'll show you is one of the... This is probably the most important of the new patterns. This is one of the new dry flies, a dun. Yeah. Um, That's absolutely amazing. Now, these look as though they're going to be pretty tricky things to dress, John. Well, they are. They're not easy to dress, and they take quite a little bit of time. But we only we're only using these for that very special fish, that very def difficult fish. Quite. You know, the more Quite. educated fish. For the ordinary run of fish, we use the standard patterns, the traditional ones. Yes. Right. Well then, let's have a go and see how we get on. All right. Well, if you get your stuff set up, I'll uh, tell you or show you how the dressing goes. Okay. The base of the creation is a simple twist of silk. Now we're using these muskrat whiskers for the tails rather than conventional cock flu because they give a much better silhouette and apart from that they're uh, much more resilient and uh, tough. Yeah, they look much better than the original. 